Hi, this is Jeff here, coming to you from our Melbourne quarantine hotel, hotel room. We have just less than a week now, and this is my uh, Q&A response um, that I've put out for uh, anybody who wants to ask us a question or suggest a subject to talk on. So um, our next question comes in from Ben Patrick. Um, ben says, we do permaculture and learn to prepare for times like this. There is everything we need when we live in a healthy community surrounded by our loved ones, a thriving ecosystem with forests and water and all the food we need in our gardens. A video to show the importance of permaculture as international policy would be nice. Well, I couldn't agree more. I think international policy would be a great result for permaculture. Um, and um, Ben's just back from uh, home in France um, with his wife Marie and Noah. Um, they've all been at Zaytuna Farm and they've been working in Southeast Asia. So um, I think one of the things we can also do is the more of us that engage in providing most of our needs with permaculture, what happens is uh, we reduce consumption and we put a lot of overconsumption out of business. Uh, unnecessary consumable items don't need to be purchased. Um, and also uh, we reduce our impact on the environment and that's been forced on us right now and the result is quite obvious with incredible environmental um, responses, um, views of you know, the Himalayas, dolphins in Venice, etc. beautiful clear water. The environment responded really fast. And, and when we know that's what we can do, um, all we need to do is live in a way that we don't put these pressures onto the environment. In fact, we can be a positive um, effect on the environment instead of just a negative that's been switched off. So um, if, if uh, on an international level, if we can realize that's, that's an initiative that we need to drive and, and there are enough people that are willing to work together, like people are working together now, they're supporting each other. If enough of us work together to demonstrate this, um, the policymakers have to have to realize this is and should be international policy. Okay, our next question is from Sarah Haycock. Hi Jeff and family, I love the work you do. Thanks Sarah, and have felt very inspired by permaculture since discovering it a couple of years ago and really enjoy your videos and knowledge. We currently live in a town, um, but also have a lovely slice of very rural property in New Zealand, um, where we've owned for five years and one day plan to build and live on. A large chunk of, uh, of it is in native that we intend to nurture and to add to, um, Sarah's question is, in relation to the other part of the property, is currently planted in approximately 20-year-old Douglas fir um, on slopes, and, and what I'd like um, advice on is how in the future um, to future-proof it, knowing uh, they'll be harvested and we'll be left with a huge bare slopes. When, uh, when we're able to, I'd like to put in water catchments on the property, food forests and animals. Sorry about the small novel, not much else to do in lockdown. I understand how you're feeling, Sarah. Okay, I think um, this being New Zealand, it's probably contract forestry. Uh, Douglas fir all planted at the same time. So what Sarah's worried about here is it can't be successionally logged because it's under some kind of forestry contract. A lot of countries like that in New Zealand and people are, uh, are closing the contracts and not going back into it because they can see the error of their ways putting monoculture onto steep volcanic slopes but uh, Sarah's probably locked in one of these contracts and the Douglas fir is all going to come out at once. I'm assuming that. I might be wrong, you can let me know Sarah. Um, so what you're going to end up with is a, is a bare um, steep slope that's been in monoculture and it's had no diversity and it's kind of uh, potentially um, infertile and um, somewhat unstable. But uh, you'll have the tree roots down in the ground and um, they'll be cut off, their stumps will be low to the ground, um, but you'll, you'll have uh, a certain amount of time before the tree roots rot away and let go. 
So uh, one thing I would try and do is try and lock the contractors in who come in and um, um, take out the, the Douglas fir in one hit. See if we can lock in uh, a wood chipper to wood chip um, all the tops and all the branches. If you, so you can reuse them on the slopes in a stability process. If you can't, then just see if you can get everything left on site that's not the logs that are taken away. And then position those on contour um, like uh, biological swales. So uh, pick your ideal contours across that landscape and lock in the branches um, and the small logs that are left behind in long contour windrows. So they're kind of like a, a, a log wood trash swale across the slope. That'll slow down the flow of water and allow you to plant into those, log, uh, those windrows because you've if I know New Zealand, you've probably got deer and goats going uh, feral, and they're gonna come in and eat your young trees as well, so all young trees will need protection. But if you've got sort of stick and branch logs, um, windrows across the steep slope, you can plant into those and get some protection for young seedlings. And then diversity plant, um, and um, I would go for novel ecosystem. Obviously, it, can't, it doesn't have to be all New Zealand. Um, it can have uh, some uh, novel, useful species in there, and it'll diversify out like um, New Zealand's population into um, a multicultural novel ecosystem of stability, plus some long-term product in there, which might be future timber as well. Um, it might be future hardy uh, fruit trees, it might be forage species, it might be fungi species. Now fungi are gonna probably respond to this event anyway. Um, so you can spore with particular fungi into any small logs that are left behind. But yeah, no, so to go, go for a diversity planning. Uh, you won't really be able to earthwork in there. It might be too steep. If it's above the penny plane, um, the ring, ring, ring plane around the volcanoes and it's steep, it's usually in New Zealand that volcanic slopes uh, are a little bit steep for swales, uh, but your tree roots are gonna get in the way anyway. But a surface wood trash windrow of organic material um, is quite good. So you'll, you'll be able to bring it back into diversity forest um, of some value to you, not just native uh, New Zealand forest, um, and uh, have a long-term successional plan in there that you can sustainably harvest over time instead of harvesting all at once, uh, cut and run type situation that the uh, fast money people are only interested in. You can have a continuous produce coming out um, indefinitely if you do it right and you harvest it right okay all right Vanessa's our next our next question and um, Vanessa says hi I have a dream to quit living in the matrix and get off the grid and I know permaculture is a key of this please may you detail how you can start learning hands-on I tried your course online but need to physically do it to learn um, thanks in advance. Well, Vanessa, one of the best things you can do is volunteer on other sites. So you've got community gardens around you, you've got other permaculture people you can look up. Um, you can just Google permaculture and the name of your area or the name of your region, and you'll find all kinds of people come up. And um, you can also look on Permaculture Global, um, which is our um, connection website, um, which is um, on, uh, the Permaculture Research Institute website, go down to the bottom, I see the icons along the bottom, the Permaculture Global, click on that one, Permaculture Global website comes up and you'll find all these connections. And, and really, you're getting the deal, right? Don't think about the fact you're giving away free labour, you're asking to learn hands-on. So what you want to do is go in and really help, really work and do what people want you to do. Um, and. Um, and, and, and realize that you're getting the lesson. Uh, you're getting this extremely valuable lesson. And you know when you're doing the right thing, when they really wa keep wanting you to come back, they, they really like the fact that you're helping them um, and you're learning as you're going. You may be getting pain-associated memory, uh, memory with the hard work, but you're learning. And, and just put in a great effort. You know, when people offer to feed you, um, they offer to accommodate you, stay longer, uh, stay long weekends. Um, you know that's a sign that you, you be, you've, you've, you've become useful, 
right? Um, and, um, you know, try and find people that you admire for what they're doing, what they've done, and what they've achieved. And don't worry that you don't always like everything they say, because we all say things we don't intend to say. And that's my advice to you. Okay, the next one is Kitty Van Ackle. My question is not related to plants or how to start, but more where to start. I know over here in Belgium, it is impossible to do all, due to all the rules and regulations. Since you know many people, you might have an idea in what country the government is most cooperative. Thanks, Kitty. Well, Kitty, there, there's not many governments that really, um, that cooperative really, are not as cooperative as they could, could be. Australia's pretty good. You know, it's sort of um, um, a generic term in Australia. We have it in our schools, permaculture, and we even have it on television and things like that. But um, um, right next door to you, Denmark's pretty good, and um, um, or close by. Um, everywhere's taken off. Uh, France is, is, is going well. You can see all, England's got a great organisation. But there's plenty going on in Belgium. If you look up Belgium permaculture, which I did to answer this question, I have quite a few Belgium students that have come through. Some are quite famous. Um, uh, Sophie van der Hind is a, uh, one of my early students at Zaytuna Farm, and she's done fantastic uh, research work um, in um, biological cleaning uh, through uh, Ghent uh, University. I've just looked her stuff up. I'm impressed. Well done, Sophie. Um, and uh, Sophie van der Hind. Um, there's also quite famous farmers that have come through our course, and there's, there's quite a few sites that you can go and get hands-on work in Belgium. Now, another thing is, and this is a funny thing, and Bill said this in my course in 83, um, the more restrictions you have on you in permaculture, the better your design. Doesn't make sense, but the more building inspectors and in, in, um, in, in uh, Department of Environment regulations and the more town planners you have um, giving you restrictions, the better you will design. So when you have a lot of regulations on you, you'll think more about the design you're going to put in, which is usually the problem people have. They don't think enough. 100 hours thinking, one hour's work instead of 100 hours meaningless work with only one hour's thinking. So um, thinking longer about the design and then getting a more uh, sophisticated uh, valuable design in place is uh, good advice. So, um, you know, if you've got uh, restrictions in Belgium, it will just make you a better designer. And you'll find a lot of people out there in Belgium will have good systems in place. I've looked it up. I just Googled permaculture Belgium and up they came. So have a look and um, get out there and, and do some volunteer work and realize that you're the one getting paid volunteering. You're getting paid with experience. There are not many places like Zaytuna Farm in Australia where people can go and get actual hands-on education courses in permaculture. Okay, our next one. Oscar, Sua, Sua, uh, Oscar Suarez. Oscar Suarez Bon. Permaculture role on reshaping the world during and after COVID-19. That's uh, cheers from Mexico blessings your way. Well, thanks, Oscar. Um, well, I think COVID-19 has made us communicate more. Um, we're we're co cooperating together online. Uh, we're asking more information. We've gone more online, which is definitely more efficient and, and uses much less energy than traveling all around the world to take permaculture courses. We've gone very much online education style, um, which is great. And I think we can continue that with online initiatives, uh, particularly um, local um, political area permaculture groups, because it's only in your local area that you ever create change. That's where change happens at a local level. And if you're looking at local government areas, your local politicians are the ones you can influence. So if we all start to set up local permaculture groups and cooperate together as online organizations, sharing our successes and failures so we can all go faster. Um, this would be a great move because then we have more and more research out on the ground and that's where we're really gonna make a difference. I say, okay, our next one is Jason Page. 
Um, could you talk a little about plants that accumulate certain minerals or carry out certain functions for the soil? Are there any good books about this topic? Well, Bill always said you have to read many books to mine little paragraphs and sentences quite often because there's not enough books written. There are some books on mineral accumulators written um, with Rodal Press. Um, there are some good uh, research out there uh, online if you, if you Google this subject. Um, what you generally are going to look at are plants that have basic functions or mineral accumulation. So let's go through some of the basics. The real common one is compaction. If you find a, a plant that has a really deep taproot and it's hard to pull out, if you look, you'll find that that plant's function is to decompact the soil and its germination condition is compacted soil. Now what you're looking at is you're looking at the symptom of a cause. The plant is the symptom. The cause of the symptom is compaction. Right? So the cause is compaction. The symptom is a deep tap-rooted plant that volunteers to grow. In every square meter of ground, you might have up to 2,000 seeds lying, ready to germinate. They're viable and you need the right condition. So if you, have, if you loosen the soil and loosen the soil and loosen the soil and powder it up continuously and continuously till it over, what you'll get is lots of weeds, happy little volunteers, often hardworking immigrants, <laughs> that'll germinate and they have hairnet roots. They, they hold together the loose soil. They have a really tight hairnet root. So just check this out, where you get those particular plants. Is the soil really loose? Now also, if you have an area that's been worked over and worked over and worked over and it's been, your crop's been taken off and taken off and taken off and nothing's been given back, and that's one of the rules of nature, you can't take without giving. You've got to give equal to what you take. It's just that what you give has to be easy to achieve and what you take has to have some value to people. And then you've got a good, good energy audit. Um, you know, your, your, your output is better than your input. So if you have an area that's been continuously harvested without any return, you're, you'll find that all the volunteer plants that come in uh, and, and nitrogen fixing. They're little peas and beans that fix nitrogen. And they've got an associate bacteria that lives on their roots, forming little nodules that are bacterial colonies, nitrogen accumulating bacterial colonies. So these are the leguminosae plants and they're an amazing family of plants. This is a massive family from small clovers and alfalfas and tiny little plants and weeds and all kinds of things right up to giant trees have this functional relationship which partner with nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil and it's really how we got to settle land I think originally you know something like um, 12,000 years ago humanity started to settle cities Baghdad uh, no Basra no uh, where am I um, Erbil Erbil and um, Damascus are the two oldest cities on earth, 12,000 years of permanent occupation. And we, they're in the Middle East in the Fertile Crescent. It was obvious that they started to realize that if they crop with peas and beans in between other crops, they refertilize the soil. And with less additions to the soil on top of that, they could hold the soil fertile for longer and get a better result. So that was really the birth of modern agriculture. Now, if you start seeing all the weeds, all the volunteer plants coming up as nitrogen fixes, you have a deficiency of nitrogen. If you see ferns and blady grasses, right, they've got uh, potassium. So anything that accumulates potassium, it's potassium that ferns and bloody grasses accumulate. Potassium is burnt off in smoke in fires. Most of your potassium accumulation is in green material, and once you've burnt off the green material, the potassium, most of it goes up in smoke. The fine fly ash that's left behind leaches through the soil very quickly because it's so fine, and you get a soil that's deficient in um, potassium. So fires, 
create a soil that's deficient in potassium. And the response is the plants that accumulate potassium when it's unavailable to most other plants. And they're your bracken ferns and blady grasses. So any plant that comes after fire is going to be most likely a potassium harvester when potassium is very hard for other plants to accumulate. Now plants that come after fire, their bodies are accumulating potassium when it's very hard to be available to other plants. They have that special ability. Thistles are iron and copper accumulators. So when you see thistles in a humid climate or in a desert climate, you're seeing iron and copper accumulation. Now that's usually because the pH has gone acid or alkali away from neutral. Iron and copper are two of the elements that quickly get locked up as the pH scale goes away from neutral. And what it is, is not that iron and copper's unavailable, well, it's, it is unavailable. It may be there, it's usually there, but the pH scale has made it unavailable. So on humid landscapes, it's usually because you've had a wet year and it's become a little bit more acid. And then you've had grazing come in and the animals have compacted the soil more than normal because of the water saturated ground and it's gone acid. And it goes to a certain level, iron and copper get locked up. It's there, but unavailable. And that spurs the germination of thistles. In the opposite direction, in dry lands where it's alkaline already, it'll go towards alkalinity and you get desert thistles coming up. So there are these wonderful indicators that something has caused the pH scale to go away from neutral and make the iron and copper unavailable. And nature's wonderful like this. It's, it's not that you are seeing that the plant's the enemy, the plant's the indicator. It just, it, it's the symptom of a cause, when the co there's some kind of damage causing this symptom to react. So it's like thinking you don't have a headache because you have a deficiency of aspirin. There's a reason you've got a headache. Uh, you go to the doctor, he tells you you've got a headache, take aspirin, right? or take some kind of headache painkiller. That's, that's, that's treating the symptom. It's not addressing the cause. This is how we have to look at the environment, like a, like a natural doctor. You should be paid for the land being fertile, and, and you should not be paid when it becomes infertile because you're not giving good advice. Like, like a natural doctor in China, where they were paid originally um, for keeping people healthy, and when people became unhealthy, they stopped being paid, and they had to get them healthy again to get paid. Uh, you know, your, your permaculture consultant could be a, 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 someone who continuously keeps the village or the farm in Hamlet in good production. So, it's the same with herbicide. You don't have weeds because you've got a deficiency of herbicide. You don't have weeds in the landscape because you've got a deficiency of glyphosate. But the chemical pharmaceutical companies would love you to think that way. And it's quite easy to get people to think that way. So this is an important thing. You can read the landscape this way. Okay. So um, now um, I have Alex Zizeg. Zig, 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 Hi, Jeff. I live in Chiang Mai, located in the mountains of northern Thailand. Have you ever visited Thailand or Chiang Mai, uh, the Rose of the North? Yes, I have actually. Um, and the um, um, there's a permaculture project in Chiang Mai that actually booked me up two years in advance to go in and teach their first PDC. Um, and it's near, uh, next to a project that's quite well known called Pun Pun, uh, which is a natural building project. And it's the only time I've been to Chiang Mai and I really liked it, it's lovely. And uh, I really like the pinto peanut that's used all in the, uh, the ground cover prostrate legume that replaces grass in most of the, uh, the nature strips and roadside edges. That's a wonderful thing about Chiang Mai, where you've got a great climate and great people to work with. Okay, Ahmed now. Ahmed Aziz, is there a manual, uh, e is there a manual easy way to dig and do earthworks without a tractor? Some soils are full of stones and yellow hard clay. Well, if you've got a lot of stone, you can build 
Stonewall Earthback Swales, like we did in the Green in the Desert project, uh, the sequel, and because uh, it just had so many stones, you, you had to do something with them. So you can pile them up as, as rock walls on contour and then backfill with soils. Um, yellow hard clay could be that you're just difficult to dig and you'd have to dig at the right time of year, right, when it's, when it's got dampness. Um, otherwise, um, if you've got spare soil somewhere else, you can bring in soil and just place the swell mound instead of digging down, which is something we do when we're working through orchards, monoculture orchards that are in position, so we don't disrupt the trees that are there and then interplant. Um, you can also bring in straw bales and lay them out on contour, um, and it'll work like a swell. So those, those are some of the ways. Otherwise, you've just got to slowly chip away uh, at your hard yellow clay. But um, clay, it's a great material because in the end it turns into fantastic fertility. So what you can do is just, it won't, at times it will be too damp and sticky to dig and other times it will be too hard to dig because it will be too dry. And it's a matter of putting all your effort in when it's just at the right moisture, when you can make headway with it. And then put in really good legume pioneer trees that love that hard clay condition because there are legumes pioneers that work in all different soils from loosest sands, dry open sands, right to the hardest clays. And even some will even grow on solid rock just about. Um, so put in those fast growing pioneer legume trees that are gonna rip through that clay and open it up with their tap roots and laterals because your follow up of trees behind them are, are really benefit from, from that event. Um, you could put down gypsum as well, you could put rip into it at the right time and crowbar it back um, and pour gypsum down, um, which is a, a clay loosening material. And um, you, you can put um, sulfur to reduce the acidity. They're all natural elements that'll help you move through that hard yellow clay. Okay, Joshua Fountain. Uh, can you talk about permaculture and hydroponics and where they overlap? Um, well, hydroponics and aquaponics, I don't think do um, overlap uh, with permaculture. Uh, you might use hydroponics if you're like stuck in an uh, intense cityscape, but you'll notice that hydroponics and aquaponics are not very long lasting before they fail because there's so much hard infrastructure and there's no soil creation. So you're, you're not really creating much soil. If you are creating sludge, at surplus sludge, you've got massive amounts of electricity running. I have seen that. I have seen enormous amounts of electricity and enormous amounts of feed going into swimming pools converted to aquaponics. Um, but when you look at the electricity input and you look at the feed input to get a gourmet fish out at the other end, it's really unsustainable. <laughs> it's a very poor energy audit. So. A sustainable system produces more energy than it consumes, enough in surplus to maintain, to build, maintain, and replace that system over its components' lifetimes. Now there's the, there's the clue. A land-based system produces soil, so a land-based system is sustainable if the soil fertility can increases and in, increases in fertility, and increases in quantity. So quality and quantity increase in soils guarantees a land-based system is sustainable. But with aquaponics, you don't have any land. It's all in plastic pipes or some kind of pipe infrastructure. There's lots of pipes, there's lots of pumps, there's lots of tanks. Um, there's got to be some kind of input because there is no natural soil partnership. And eventually, you know, pipes wear out, pumps wear out, buildings that they're in wear out. Uh, the inputs wear out. When you start doing organic um, hydroponics, all the pipes start to clog up because organic materials rot and, and go you know, fuzzy and mucky and moldy and algae and all this. When you do chemical hydroponics, um, you don't get so much residue, but we don't do chemicals. Uh, we're completely organic. We don't muck about with this stuff. We don't go anywhere near that stuff. So we can't do chemical hydroponics. 
um, organic hydroponics, like I say, snag up and clog up with the organic materials getting all rotten and fudgy in the lines. But you, your infrastructure falls over and you can't grow another pipe, you can't grow another tank, you can't make another electric pump, and they're running 24 seven. So you do energy in to energy out analysis, they're pretty low. Um, and, and, and vertical gardens and all that are just hopeless on the energy audit and, and terrible. So you don't see these things lasting. You know, you might get some planted vertical gardens, but not productive ones easily. They're very hard to maintain when they're going up the side of a building. Aeroponics is just a joke. I mean, that's just, just ridiculous. Anybody that thinks they can spray air, you know, airborne nutrient between two sheets of glass and not have it go moldy is, is joking. Um, you know, nature's very reactive when it comes to you know, organic deposits. So, um, yeah, I don't think there's an overlap there, really. Um, I try not to get involved in that stuff um, at all. And you'll see so many failed hydroponic farms, so many, you know, and if you start going indoors and under false lights as well, oh my goodness, the energy audit's ridiculous. And they just won't last. It's, it's, you don't stand a chance. Might, you might think, oh, well, this is survival food in the city for now, but the intention is to get outside and partner with nature. There's no hydroponics in nature, and there's no aquaponics in nature. You can do outdoor systems that are sort of similar, um, very intense aquaculture, um, and you can get into really amazing swamp systems, um, but they're not this um, hard um, industrial agriculture, industrial infrastructure, uh, hydroponics, aquaponics stuff. Okay. Fiona Baker. Hi, Jeff. Um, great to see you and your family safe and well. Thanks, Fiona. Uh, we have a lifestyle block and are in drought. Our pond is dried out, so we have taken the opportunity to double the depth and cut a swale from the hill next to the pond. Can you suggest plants and trees that would add to the health of the pond? Um, thanks from Waikiki Island, and that's New Zealand, wonderful spot. Hopefully you've dug a swale that can back flood from the pond at high, uh, when it gets to spillway height. So uh, I like, not everybody does it, but I like to have a swale at uh, the base of the trench, the bottom of the trench is just below, say half a meter, quarter of a meter, below the height that the pond overflows on the spillway so that as the, the swale fills, it fills the dam and then before the dam overflows, it fills, backs up the swale and then at a specific height, the spillway of the dam is also the spillway of the swale. So you get to flood the swale with the back flood of the dam filling. Um, and then all the water that's in the swale has to go through the swale mound and the same height of water on the dam has to go through the swale. That way you get a, a, an extra amount of nutrient water and extra water in your swale. So I would go for clumping bamboos. Uh, I know the native only people are gonna get all funny about this, but never mind. Uh, clumping bamboos are magnificent. Um, uh, they're all edible, and the large ones are very edible. You probably get away with old hammy eye there, bambusa old hammy eye, which is a great edible and lovely erect bamboo and quite valuable. You have some good bamboo in New Zealand, um, up north there near Kerry Kerry. You have some good uh, bamboo plantings. Textilis gracilis is the weaving bamboo, very valuable when you start to divide these out. Landscapers want them a lot. So Textilis gracilis, the weaver's bamboo. Um, and uh, Old Hammy Eye, a fantastic sweet shoot food bamboo and light timber. And they're both uh, frost hardy. They'll take uh, minus two, minus three, kind of. Um, they have very short branches and they're very erect, so they're very elegant. And, uh, and landscapers love them. So when you're good enough to divide, you're in the money on that. You're in the money in, in, in um, product um, as well for crafts and weaving and and food as shoots and, and all kinds of things. Um, also willows, another non-native, only northern hemisphere in the natural world, but wonderful plant. Uh, both bamboo and um, willows, uh, they don't have tap roots, so they don't compromise the damn wall. So you can plant them on a damn wall um, and they won't, they won't 
um, compromise the integrity of the dam wall. In fact, they'll help the dam wall hold together. So if you get one of your New Zealand earthquakes, it'll help hold the wall together. Then it'll also work around the back of the dam, but all kinds of other things will work around the back of the dam because you haven't got a, a constructed wall to compromise. The thing with bamboos is that nothing grows in the drip line because of the hair root dominates around the clumping bamboo. Um, it doesn't spread because it's clumping. And you get this high silica roof, uh, leaf fall that um, creates almost like a bamboo beach on the shoreline of the dam. Because everything wants to grow around the shoreline of the dam because you've got a nice water supply soaking into the soils. Um, so it, it takes the maintenance out around the shoreline of the dam, gives you something to sit on that's quite beautiful. Um, the dam wall itself is, um, um, doesn't need any maintenance because of that. Willows do something similar. And there are va very valuable willows. There are willows that have great value, like basketry willow, again, for weaving baskets. But you also have um, uh, artist pencil willow that has great value if you charcoal it, um, easy to grow. It's also great forage for animals. Animals like to grow, like to eat bamboo and um, leaves and willow leaves. They're both great forage. Palms will grow on your dam wall as well because they just have a hairnet root. So if there are some cooler climate palms you can grow, there's plenty I'd imagine that would fit into Waikiki Island uh, for your dam wall. And then on the back of the dam, on the back of the dam, away from the dam wall, on the back shoreline, the upper shoreline, you can grow all kinds of things. It's, it's anything you like. Mulberries are wonderful. Mulberries hang over the water. Um, and um, you can actually um, seed your mulberry leaves with uh, silkworm eggs. Um, if it's a white mulberry, they go very well on the, on the big white mulberry because it has higher protein, another great forage. And um, if you get silkworms on your mulberries, you can shake the branch and get them to actually um, fall in the water. Get in a low battery call on my phone. So yeah, silkworms on white mulberry leaves are a Chinese technique for feeding fish when they hatch into silkworms. Um, there are all kinds of things you can do there. Okay, we'll go one more here. Um, Zachary Barton, how to adapt regenerative agricultural practices to small scale subsistence farming in the two thirds world? Well, I think they're the teachers really of that. Um, Agriculture is probably one of the dan most dangerous activities we've ever uh, attempted um, in its present industrial form. Um, we've got to repair so much industrial agricultural damage. Um, it's so extensive and so large, um, and we should make it illegal, really, um, something akin to witchcraft. Um, so, you know, when we get down to scale of order of size, the smaller sizes are so much more efficient and employ so many more people and create such a, 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 a higher value product, more diversity, more nutrient density, um, way more stability and much more production over the area. So per square meter, more productive and much more value to local uh, community product. So um, that's a system that's often um, still in place or was in place uh, more recently in the two-thirds world, and, um, and people can see the sense of that. So uh, regenerative agriculture scaled down is permaculture. Regenerative agriculture is a bit of a worry, I reckon. Um, you're trying to um, turn something that's way out of scale into something that's regenerative, and it won't happen well until you start coming down in size and diversifying extremely... Um, um, rapidly because you, you, agriculture generally is way too simplistic and, and much too large, way out of scale. So you have to come down in size um, and you have to diversify um, way more than, than, than present practice. And it's easier to start small and go bigger until you get to a chaos point. You see, chaos is an interesting principle. Um, any system that's oversupplied with energy that can't put to productive use goes into chaos. Well, if you're so far out of so scale of size and you're so simplistic and you start to reduce size a bit and increase diversity a bit, you're in chaos for many, many moves. You fail many, many times when you start as such a, a, 
in a, an at a scale system like agriculture in its present industrial form, you've got to come so many moves backwards from that size. Um, you're facing many failures if you gradually, incrementally reduce the size and increase the diversity. But if you start small, very small, and, and you, or you already have a small size and you, and you go with maximum diversity and select your extension with the successful diversity, each move outwards continues to be an extending success now, which is much more psychologically, <laughs> it gives you much more psychological incentive. And then at a point where it fails, it's because you've just gone a little bit too big and you can't extend the diversity far enough in a rugged enough form to that size, you pull back a fraction. And you're at the point of, of maximum size and maximum diversity that's, that's sensible. So right on the edge of chaos, which is really where you are, because any system that's oversupplied with energy that can't put into productive use goes into chaos. So another saying is, right on the edge of chaos is the ultimate opportunity for creative form. That's a great point to finish, and I'll see you on the next round of Q&A.